Hi there, it's Ron Gula from Gula Tech Adventures. In this week's segment, which I'm calling No Easy Fixes for Cybersecurity, I'm going to discuss five common ideas people outside of cyber and sometimes people inside cyber suggest when they try to solve how we can keep the internet safe and secure. Now, if you read the National Cybersecurity Strategy, it's it's long, it's complex. If you're ever read something like the NIST Cybersecurity Framework, it's long, it's complex. It's long and complex for a reason, right? The internet is insanely complicated. We have a lot of different users. We have a lot of different stakeholders. So fixing the internet and keeping it secure means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Having said that, over my career talking with politicians, people in cyber, people outside of cyber, I get a lot of different suggestions on how things could be fixed. So we're gonna go through five of these. So the first one comes from the venture capital community. Wouldn't it be great if all of our cyber products were just simply deployed, right? Out, out, out there protecting everybody. And this is like a really good thing. Everybody's working on this thing. But the reality is that a couple things can happen. So one, if you create the best intrusion prevention or malware detection type company, you eventually become the biggest target that people try to bypass. You either die startup or you live long enough to see yourself bypassed. So right now, I'm recording this in 2024, you know, top malware security vendor is Proofpoint, top EDR vendor is CrowdStrike, and I can readily go to most hacker conferences and red teaming, you know, to uh, workshops and people will talk about how to actively exploit and bypass those uh, those products. This is just the way it is. This is going to keep going. Now, the second thing that happens with security products is that they get acquired and they become part of a platform. Now, a lot of times when you have a small company and you have a niche company solving a problem for, for real customers and it gets traction, these companies can get acquired by larger organizations, larger platforms like you know Cisco, Palo Alto, which is in the news recently basically saying this is their strategy. And now that technology and solution becomes more of a larger platform. Well, the economics, the customer interest, and the focus on the product of a startup might not necessarily be the same thing with a platform store, even though it can be a broader, more holistic, and, and possibly even better in the long-term solution. But a lot of times, that tech doesn't get the same care and feeding that it did on the outside of that, of that organization. And then finally, there's actually a lot of organizations just want to like help small business get more secure. And they will throw dollars at them. They will try to do economic incentives. And a lot of times these dollars and economic incentives really just are basically a Microsoft project where people who are in the small businesses use Microsoft and we're basically going to end up paying for them to use more Microsoft technologies, which again, might be the right answer, but it might also be something you're not going to hear a politician say when they're helping small businesses and restaurants be more secure. So, so it's not really going to happen that we have the right cybersecurity solution deployed everybody out there for these reasons. And I can go on and on. It's like it's also evolution of technology, right? When I first got into cybersecurity, we didn't have mobile phones, right? Now we have mobile phones and we have mobile phone security products. We're about to see the same thing for AI. Now, the second type of thing I'll hear people suggest is, wouldn't it be great if we all had sort of a digital ID? And a digital ID can be useful for many, many things, including being able to go to my email and select, gee, I only want emails from, from Americans, from people I know, people in my business. If you work in the enterprise, you probably work with some sort of authentication system where I, Ron Gula, get access to my documents and my applications and that sort of thing. And people want to extend that to the internet. But even in, even in the enterprise situation, you know, enterprise to enterprise can be really tough, right? How do I know who can access from one partner enterprise to another? It's, it's kind of difficult. But when you go to the entire country, you run into a couple issues. One, who's going to manage that? Right now, the largest authentication providers in the country are Microsoft and Google. When you go to a, a website and you choose to authenticate with your email and your, your, uh, your, your, your Gmail account, your Google account, whatnot, you're kind of letting Google um, you know, do that authentication for you. And as a nation, are we going to let them do that for voting? Are we going to let them do that for paying our bills? We might go there as a society, but it certainly isn't a federal program the same way that the post office is or the IRS is. And a lot of times you're not going to see the federal government kind of step in and do this because if you do a digital identity, you're going to run into a lot of the hot water of, um, of voting identities. There's a lot of political issues navigating 
do you do voter identification? Can you only vote once? Or even get into digital digital voting. So we basically have phishing and we basically have this kind of fraud because we don't have a way to describe who all these people on the internet are. Are they Americans? Who are they? Do they have some sort of, of, of credential with them? We have the technology, we just don't really have a will as a country to, um, to, to do that. Now, another thing, the third thing I have a lot of people suggest, especially when I was running Tenable, is why can't we fix all the vulnerabilities? Like, why can't we just patch everything? And folks who are in the business, they know how hard it is to deploy a patch, right? Even if you're watching this on, on, on uh, YouTube right now, is your browser up to date? Like a lot of times I see people in the upper corner, I, you know, I'm on a webinar and even with people who are pitching us for, for investment from Google Tech, and you'll see, you know, click here to upgrade, right? A lot of people just don't do this. And if you're in the large enterprise, trying to push a patch is almost like an act of war or self-denial of service attack because you got to schedule an outage. It's never a good time and, 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 and so on. So one of the things that uh, I always tell people outside of the business is that, look, when these patches come out, enterprises have these thing called controls, which are really excuses to, to not patch because they've got really good excuses like the system's offline, it's hardened, or that's, that, that application's not running. But we really don't have a good sense of being able to push the software out and, and, and getting it patched. And even if we could, there's still two other classes of software out there or devices that, that we can't touch, right? There's legacy software. So the software that's in use right now, but it's out of business and there's no updates for it. It's really, really hard to patch. And then some things are just not designed to be to be updated. Or I'm filming this on a Sony 4K camera that I, I haven't updated the firmware. It's not connected to the internet, but everybody has a different piece of IoT software that's that's out there. Now, I am really excited about newer content inspection technologies such as our investment in Trinity Cyber, which can virtually patch client-side and server-side vulnerabilities as it traverses the, uh, the, the network. Outside of patching all those vulnerabilities, the fourth thing really involves government. Role. Like, can we regulate people to produce secure technology and can we regulate them to run secure businesses? So right off the heels of can I patch all these vulnerabilities, People say, well, can't we simply regulate technology vendors to do secure software? The problem is this, is everybody's version of security is a little bit different than everybody else's. It, so you can do things like, well, you know, do you have a bill of materials, right? There's something called an, 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 an SBOM, software bill of materials. So I can see what's built. Can I look at the source code? Well, my source code might have heavy intellectual property. And in today's day and age of artificial intelligence, you don't get to see the source code for an artificial intelligence because it's petabytes of, of, uh, of data. You're just not going to inspect that and understand that without doing a vast amount of, of, uh, of testing on it, which is one of the reasons in the recent uh, executive order from the White House, they are looking for these next generation AIs to basically self-report to the, to the uh, federal government what they're doing to red team and test these, uh, the, these AIs. So it's pretty easy to say, hey, we want more security. It's a hard thing to do to say we get that. So instead, what we end up getting are things like security labels where we want the vendors to self-attest what, what they're doing. Or we get statements like, hey, let's switch from unsafe programming languages to safer programming languages. And the most recent uh, one of those is to have memory-safe programming. Like, I can, I can still write exploits on memory-safe things. It's harder to do. But for the most part, you can get, um, you know, incrementally better progress. And these are the right things to do. Unfortunately, I don't see where it really kind of... We, we never get to, like airplane safety, where we have consistent and safe airline travel. We're always kind of missing that a little bit on the security side. So another thing people say is, can the government regulate industry? Uh, if you're a, a hospital, if you're an insurance agency, if you're a bank, if you're if you're someplace that you know deals with, with, with data, can we regulate people and require them to do things to move the needle in a certain place? And in almost every case the government has tried to do this, there has been tremendous pushback from uh, from industry. Even after Colonial Pipeline, there was a lot of the industrial control systems, oil petroleum people who were pushing back on, you know, the the sort of things coming out Washington, D.C. because they're very out of sync. Now, are we going to get better? Are we going to have better regulations? Are we going to have better understanding of these threats? Yes, we will go forth. But to have basically the federal government say, thou must, you know, be NIST cybersecurity framework compliant or some other framework compliant, it's tough, especially when you have, you know, 
three million businesses or 100 million small business, whatever the number is here in, in, in the country, with different resources and attack surfaces and capabilities than perhaps, you know, the Fortune 200, Fortune 300. And a couple of examples other that we've seen the federal government try to push is even when they're not doing legislation, requiring people to do a certain type of cybersecurity hygiene, perhaps they're going to just do it with the power of the purchase book. So the most recent example of this is the Department of Defense's CMMC program, which basically says if you're going to sell things to the federal government, the DOD in particular, you have to maintain a certain cybersecurity hygiene level. And they have a bunch of different levels. First level self-attestation, where you just basically claim to do and assert what you're doing with no real proof at, 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 at all. There was pushback from the DOD supply chain people to this saying, hey, look, this is a hidden tax. This is something that's really going to hurt our business. And if you think about small business coming off of the heels of COVID, for example, barely being cash flow positive, forcing people to spend another 10%, 5% of their IT budget on cybersecurity is actually something that can be you know, a little detrimental to a small business who's really, really hurting for cash flow. So then the last thing I've had people suggest is that, well, why can't the federal government, you know, just go on offense and and take out these threat actors? Well, you know, not all threat actors come from foreign nations, right? There's a lot of hacking that happens internally here in the U.S. There's a lot of personal hacking, personal spyware, that sort of thing. But let's talk about ransomware for a second. The R in ransomware is for Russia. Almost all ransomware comes out of, of, of Russia. Now, it's not government sanctioned. It's government tolerated. So what does going on offense really mean? Could we really go into Russia and try to do that? No. So what the Internet uh, you know, Task Force, uh, Ransomware Task Force, um, just, just kind of got through is let's go after the infrastructure, right? So there's a lot of, every time you see one of these takedowns and you see somebody from the FBI or the DOJ work, they're, they're basically telling that, that a network was taken down of, of ransomware. Those people are probably still alive driving their their Maseratis or whatever they're doing, but the infrastructure that they use to send you the email, to fish, to get you know a ransomware, that infrastructure is gone. And what does that mean? It means that the, whatever they use to co-op that has been systematically taken down all at once. That's what Defend Forward looks like. That's what public-private sector stuff uh, lo looks like. But what about China? What about the APTs that come from China? There's no there's no funny joke that the A and P and T stands for the the C in China and that sort of thing. But the vast majority of Chinese, um, you know, theft in the country here with IP is using some form of backdoor, uh, an APT, some sort of covert channel, that that type of thing. Is the government actively working on that? Yes, they absolutely are, right? There's counterintelligence. You have the FBI, the DOJ, the whole law enforcement thing. You have a whole separate intelligence community kind of uh, approach to this. You have another whole nother segment of, uh, of the DOD who's working on keeping people out of the DOD and trying to make sure that uh, you know our assets in the Pacific Fleet are good. But it's not like we can simply push a switch and all traffic from China you know, can, can, can turn off. It's, we do a lot of business with China. We do a lot of, of, uh, of trade with communications with China. So just to, there, we, there's no magic switch that the government can do to just push that. And we've had ebbs and flows of, of Chinese cyber espionage over, over the years. I, I still think it's been kind of consistent over, over the time. But I really believe if, the, if it was an easy thing to do, we would do it. But it's not because their tactics keep, keep changing and uh, the targets keep changing, right? They might go after a small business that's a vital contractor to a, 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 a bigger contractor. They might target directly a, uh, a senator or a congressperson in Washington, D.C. So we've seen all sorts of different types of approaches there. All right. So... That's five quick things like why we just can't solve uh, these cybersecurity issues with no, with no easy fixes. But what, what can we do? So I, I, if you watch this channel, you're going to know what I'm going to say, right? So one, we need more people in this business, right? We call it the wrong thing. Cybersecurity is a tough thing for people to understand. I like to call it data care. It makes it very, very easy to attract people, including minorities, to this career field. It also gives people a sense of personal responsibility for their electronic devices and, 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 and their data. Second thing, if you're giving advice to an MSP, stop acting like a, a, a lawyer that you see chasing ambulances, you know, on 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 TV. When you when you people throw out use two factor, you know, uh, uh, get logging analysis, be compliant. It's really kind of you don't really know the business. So the the consistent thing to tell an FSMB or a, a nonprofit is to get an MSSP, get get somebody who's going to do your cyber for you, and have them and treat them. 
the same way that you treat your lawyers for your legal business and your certified public accountants for your finances and tax work, right? We need to put cyber on that same plane as, as, as those folks. You know, large enterprise, there's a lot of resources in large enterprise. There's some, some bigger issues that they, that they have, but for the most part, large enterprises, you know, they're doing a fairly decent job. And you can see what happens when you have a have and have not of how they respond to attack. If you compare, for example, some of the recent attacks in Las Vegas where two different firms were attacked, one was totally compromised, one wasn't. Um, this happens all the time in large enterprise and they, they, uh, they, they're sharing, they're learning, they're, they're, they're doing that. But lastly, if you can speak to any politician, what I would tell you is that don't talk about cyber as the most important thing, right? We have, a, this is an election year, we've got the economy, we've got a couple major wars that are going on, we have a lot of issues with our, our, uh, our border and, and crime and, and, and uh, just you know how, how we're doing as a, as, a, as a country. Cyber is typically not the number one thing that people wanna hear about, but cyber is involved in every one of those things. So the way to kind of keep cyber at the forefront of these things is to make it part of almost everything else that that you're doing. So, uh, if your issues, you know, green uh, energy, if your issues, uh, you know, food supply, cyber is components of all of those things, so we can have a safe and reliable society. So, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you enjoyed the animations and uh, the stuff that we put in there. Uh, I'm Ron Gula. If you want to see more videos like this, uh, please drop us a note here on LinkedIn. Give this uh, channel a subscribe if you like this. And, uh, you know, keep working on that internet, keeping it safe and secure. Thanks for watching.